Right thinking leads to freedom. I tell you truly, insofar as you did it to one of these, my brothers, even to the least of them, you did it to me. Matthew 35, 40. Right thinking can only come when one knows oneself. To know oneself there must be discernment of all that is in the mind that influences the self. Ideas, desires, beliefs must be recognized and their cause must be understood. Otherwise one is caught up in these things and is influenced by them. Now the thing is, what is the cause of these ideas, beliefs? All these things that are influencing the self, it's the self. The self is the cause. Because the self does not discern the self and does not understand the self, nor does it understand its ways. It's caught up in these things, and then when the self is caught up in the maze bounds, the self is lost. There is freedom in truth. It releases the self. If your thought is molded to a pattern, your understanding will conform to this conditioning. Your thought feeling will be in accordance with your tradition or belief. Your thought shapes itself according to your background. If while in childhood you are influenced by religion, your adult life will be in accordance with what held fixed in your mind. Without self-knowledge we build our illusions based upon the background of one belief or another. But to experience the real there must be infinite pliability of mind, a deep basic stillness where the background tradition beliefs have been discerned and understood. And when we look through the world, we see so many different patterns. Patterns which children are brought up to discern. Mohammedism, Hinduism, Catholicism, and many forms of Christianity. All these are in themselves just matter of ideas and beliefs. But what is the truth? It was Jesus himself that revealed that when he said, I and the Father are one. When you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Know you not, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. To him these were not ideas but living realities. But if your mind is conditioned by beliefs and you are held in the grip of this conditioning, you will never understand the great truth that the Master showed. This pliability and tranquility is not the outcome of conflict, tradition, belief, or separation. It comes into being with true understanding, and understanding comes with self-knowledge. You will readily see that without self-knowledge you merely live in a state of contradiction and uncertainty. Without self-knowledge, what you think, feel, has no basis. It's an illusion. Without self-knowledge, enlightenment is impossible. When you see that you are the world, that your neighbor, your friend, your so-called enemy is yourself, you will begin to understand yourself. To understand the complex, the mind-heart must be extremely simple. The truth is distorted by ideas, theories, concepts, creeds, beliefs, etc. These limit and confuse the mind. 
Mind must be freed from these distortions, otherwise there is no awareness of the real which is beyond the mind, which is unlimited and free. That which is unlimited and free is the only reality. Anything that is binding is not reality. Anything that is limited is but an idea, belief. Unless the mind is free from these illusions, what you know of the truth is but an idea, an image of the truth. And truth reality is none of these, but through self-knowledge comes awareness of the truth reality, then there is no rushing here nor there, there is no anxiety in case you cannot find it, for it is ever present now, only waiting to come forth when you give it opportunity. That is to say, when you become aware. The mind is the vehicle through which this great mighty power will manifest itself. But the mind must be pliable. The mind must be calm as the ocean that is still down in the depth so far. Then there is understanding. There is nothing more ignorant than a mind that is fixed and rigid. There is nothing more stupid than to ridicule anything you do not understand. The continuous striving to be something you image you should be to ensure eternal life and all that goes with it creates constant struggle. The struggle ceases when you realize that you cannot comprehend that which is beyond your mind, but you can discern that which is hindering its true expression. This true experience can only be a reality when we free our mind from the past, the future, from preconceived ideas that blunt the mind heart. The creativeness that is in the mind heart comes forth into true expression in form from within. Therefore, transformation comes from within. I am the doorway that leads to the Father. This doorway must be kept clear and open. Through this doorway the Father comes forth into expression in the individual. And you become the chosen one. How difficult it is sometimes to... Get the past out of your mind. How difficult it is also to let the future alone. If you are engaged in the past and the future, how can you ever understand the ever-present? It's impossible. When the individual is not conditioned by beliefs, Tradition, limitation, and illusion that Christ will show forth as the light of the world. I may talk, you may talk about reality, but what we say and think about reality is not reality itself. But if your mind can be cleared of all these things that prevent reality from manifesting, then you'll become aware of that which is behind the mind. If you have in the mind only an idea, an image, and a belief, you're caught up in that belief. That is not reality. Reality is a living expression of God, as you see before you now, as I look before you. There can be no other. 
In John 12, verse 44, 45, Jesus cried aloud, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who beholds me beholds him who sent me. He who beholds me, the living example of him who sent me, will find that same livingness in himself. That is the meaning of the Master's words. In verse 49 to 50, For I have not spoken of my own accord, the Father who sent me, he it was who ordered me what to say and what to speak. And I know that his orders mean eternal life. Once you have grasped eternal life and the source of that, and to find that source within yourselves, you have risen out of beliefs into freedom. In the Bible it says clearly, Take hold of this tree of life, for it shall be your salvation. Do not eat of this fruit of this tree of knowledge of good and evil, otherwise you die in your ignorance. Therefore, when I speak, I speak of as Father has told me. This was the Christ speaking, but note this. God, being all there is, created us free and unlimited like himself in his own image and likeness. His consciousness, intelligence and substance molded into form. Here is the great truth. When the mind is free and unlimited, we are inspired by the Father, who himself is the living expression here now. The Son knows the Father who is speaking <coughs> through him only when he is free <coughs> from all illusion. According to your faith, so will it be unto you, but your faith must not be limited or confused with a mind full of opposites, such as fear, Faith, good, evil, etc. This is why self-knowledge is so essential to the freedom of the truth. The greatest hindrance and the greatest unhappiness in the world today is brought about by the stupidity of most people who concentrate upon the lack, the things they do not have, instead of counting their blessings one by one. As you try to comprehend the truth with a background of ideas caught up, from Christianity with its changing interpretation, when one thing is worn out and new one is created, you will live in the illusion of separation and ignorance. If your mind is confused with the differing concepts such as Mohammedism, Buddhism, Theosophy, etc., the reaction will be confusion because you try to conform to these ideas and judge everything on what you have accepted, whether it be true or not. These beliefs are but ideas, concepts, and will remain as such. But reality is none of these. Reality is greater than all creation, yet it is one with creation. Therefore, right thinking alone leads toward freedom of the truth. To say the word God does not give you the truth, to say God is love does not give you the truth, 
any statement, no matter what it may be, about God or truth is not truth for God. There must be a cleansing of the mind, a clearing of the forest track through which you will see the light. And that light will burn greater and grander as you come nearer and nearer to it through the realization of it. Then as you become aware of it, your awareness will be one of splendor. One that is ever widening, never contracting. Never again will you be caught up in the world of illusion, because you have once found that freedom, that expansion of the consciousness of God that is indwelling in yourself. Consciousness of God that envelops all things in the whole universe are within his own consciousness. That consciousness of God, being infinite in nature, that can be none other. Therefore, that consciousness is my consciousness, your consciousness. But it cannot become an actuality to you or me to such time as we have cleared the mind of the things that hinder it. As I speak, I am looking, seeing words that I have given to me. And as I read those words before my eyes at the close, I know that they are spiritually given. And these messages I give you, remember, they are of you. And, of course, also of me. Truth, reality, God, the Father, are but names we give to life. Life is not a name. All these words are relative and are not truth. All the talking in the world about truth does not mean truth, a reality, to you or me. We must find this reality in ourselves as the living expression of life itself. This is what Jesus did and what we must do if we are to be like him. If you pattern your life after what you have read or heard from others, it will only lead to conflict, sorrow, and confusion. And your truth is nothing more than ideas and theories which cover up the real so your conception of truth will be a continual movement from one illusion to another illusion, from one teacher to another teacher, only leading you to further conflict. You cannot define reality, for there is nothing with which we can compare it with. It is beyond mind. But when you free your consciousness from limitation, it becomes expansive and awareness of the whole is understood. Then the I myself loses itself in the whole, and the nature is transformed. But there must be continued awareness of the whole, lest limitation and illusion enter in. If you crave to be something which will ensure you a place in the eternal, your craving will lead you from one teacher to another, from one system to another, 
And this will lead you away from the ever-present reality that is within yourselves. This in the future that you want will never come. It will always be in the future. Just like the donkey is chasing after the carrot that's in front of it. And everyone that does these things is just like the donkey. But the ever-present reality is now. There's never been anything else but now. This is the truth that I see. The world that I appear before my consciousness is this. Where wast thou when I laid the foundation of the world? I was with thee when thou laidst the foundation of the world. The majority of seeking will pause when there's a feeling of satisfaction. They think they have found the truth, but this only lasts for a short time. Then the hunt begins again with renewed effort along the path of illusion, without understanding. So book after book is explored and digested with only one result. The mind becomes more confused only with understanding and awareness of the whole. Will books be of any value to you? But there are few who know the freedom of truth. Those who write books on truth are generally those who are themselves seeking the truth. Truth is an, a continuous unfold. When you have found that source within yourselves, then there is expansion for consciousness and understanding of the whole. Not till then. The Master says, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have everlasting life. You make a mistake. The reading of the Bible or any other book does not confer eternal life. This must be found within and not without. The everlasting reality can only be understood in the fullness of the present, discerning everything that surrounds you in the reality, while aware of the real within now, not in some distant future which is but a passing fantasy. The real is not something that you can imagine or fancy. What you imagine or fancy is not the truth, reality. What you have is but an image in the mind. To understand the whole, there must be non-attachment to ideas and beliefs, the past and the future. What is spiritual and what is not spiritual. For when you pattern your life after these, there is fear, limitation, and confusion. But when there is an understanding of the ever-present God Almighty, the creator of all things in you and me, the very life of me and you is the Almighty, then there is no image, no limitation, no fear. I remember when fear disappeared. It was in the First World War. It was something that I experienced. And only, I suppose, when I came to my mortal senses did I realize what I did. It was in the early morning when there was a raid. It was necessary to get prisoners, and we got some. But in coming back again, some of the men 
is under me, were wounded or killed. Now, I had a very lovely friend called Jock. And he was one of the boys that never came back. I was an officer, of course, and he was just a pride. We came from the same part of the Highlands, and we had grown up together, and we had naturally, long before the war, made strong attachments. And Jock didn't come back. I was disturbed. And you will know how those who have been there, no man's land is no man's land. Machine guns rattling, bullets flying here and there, shells landing all over the place. I forgot all about it. I climbed over the trench and went over to find Jock. And when I looked down, I saw another fellow. Another one of my fellows, he, was look, he looked at me. I couldn't pass him by. I took him up and carried him in. But I wasn't satisfied with that. By the by, there was a French unit beside us, which was on our right. And they also had a number of men in this raid. So I went out again, and here I found a Frenchman, and I took this Frenchman in. All the time I do not know, but the bullets must have been flying, but not one hit me. I know that there was about five I carried in, and then I found John. But I carried him in all the same. I remember my words to Jock was this. Jock, you're a luckier fellow than I am. You're out of this mess. At the time, I did these things just in the spur of the moment. But I found I had no fear. I have never had fear since that moment. Naturally, I never expected anything, but when the citation came through, I found I got the French Victoria Cross, the British Military Cross. I always say that I got it for saving life and not for taking. And with these months, the fear disappears. The self completely obliterated. The self had fear. And I've often spoken to Jock since he passed. Dozens and dozens of times. I've spoken to him and he's spoken to me. And upon intimate things that we alone knew and understood, which shows there is no death. So it isn't a distant fantasy. It is not the future, which is but a passing fantasy, but the ever-present is the eternal life. Now, If you look to your mind heart, you will find and hear the theories of right and wrong. The mind heart may be filled with religion and theories to which you conform, and there is no room for wisdom and love. If you follow a ritual, you have no love. There is no wisdom in following anything in which there is no love. What is necessary is that we keep the mind heart free so that love and wisdom can manifest without hindrance. This we see strongly enough in Jesus himself in John 12, verse 27. 
Now is my soul troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. This then is Jesus in his mortal sense, the human sense of the man. Then Jesus answers, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains a single grain. But if it dies, it bears rich fruit. He who loves his life loses it, and he who cares not for his life in this world will preserve it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. Where I am, there shall my servant also be. If anyone serves me, my father will honor him. In verse 23, Jesus said those words when the Gentiles came to see him. The story means drawing of all men, both Jews, and Gentiles into the kingdom of the Christ of God, his kingdom. Verse 24, the grain of wheat shows the eternal life comes out of so-called death of the body and is present now that eternal life is in the body now. Also glory out of self-sacrifice. Verse 25 serves to mean to minister into others and to follow in the Master's ways, giving of the Christ within to all, no matter who they are, that is love and compassion and forgiveness. Truly, some people say they have forgiven but in the back of their mind they can never forgive that's not forgiveness there must be complete forgiveness just as the father himself put his arm around the son the prodigal he didn't listen to him, saying, I have sinned against thee, I am no longer worthy to be called thy son. He says, bring the best robe, bring a ring and put it on the finger and sandals on his feet. How could he do otherwise? Verse 27, my soul is now disquieted, troubled. What am I to say? Father, save me from this hour. Nay, it is something else that has brought me to this hour. 28. I will say, Father, glorify thy name. Then came a voice from heaven. I have glorified it. I will glorify it again. Verse 27. In his soul he held the fullness of his human life. And there was the temptation to withdraw from the great task to reveal the Christ to all, Jew and Gentile alike. And for doing this, he knew that his own people would reject him because they thought they were the chosen people. But he says, Father, glorify thy name. And a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. And Jesus says again, But I, when I am lifted up from earth, will draw all men to myself. This indicates to the revealing power of the crucifixion, revealing the eternal life of the Christ within, all would be drawn to the Christ that lives now as the light of the world 
as the only begotten Son of the Father, showing the Christ as in the unique position of being in the world, yet not of the world, not born of flesh and blood, but born of the word that flows from the mouth of God, meaning the life of the Father. The breath of life is the life of God in man, and is the word that was in the beginning with God. Call no man your father on earth, for one is your father in heaven. This is the most wonderful thing that Jesus saw. All people must be drawn to the Christ. Their Lord is the free. In verse 44, Jesus cried aloud, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who beholds me beholds him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world, that no one who believes in me may remain in the dark. Here again he reveals the universality of the life of the Christ in man. The universality of the life in you and me. The life in me is in no way separate, in no way distinct from the life of God in the universe. The life in me at this moment is in no way distinct from that life that is the totality of all life. It cannot be. God being infinite in nature, God being life. This was the Word that was with God, the Word that was God, and was in the beginning. In verse 44, Jesus cried aloud, so he sees. These words, he who believes in me, believes not in me, but him who sent me. What a wonderful Verse 47, if anyone hears my words and does not keep them, hold them, the old person says, and believe not. It is not I who judge him, for I have not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The word I have spoken will judge him. Christ cannot judge anyone, being Christ. Being love, love can't judge hate, otherwise it become hate. Love can't see hate, otherwise it become hate. For I have not spoken of my own accord, the Father who sent me, he it was who ordered me what to say and what to speak. And I know that his orders mean eternal life. Therefore, when I speak, I speak as the Father told me. Verse 44 to 50 describes a summary of the Master's teachings. Believe in Christ and to believe in God the Father. Therefore, his teachings are that we must discern all that hinders the expression of the Christ within. This hindrance is lack of love for our fellow men, our belief in separation. These are the great enemies of the Christ, which will eventually be put under his feet. Those two are the causes of all the misery in the world. In so far as you did it unto one of these, my brethren, even to the least of them, you did it unto me. So it is taken in both ways, the kindness and the forgiveness you do unto one of these, the very least of them, 
you do unto me. Yes, and in the opposite direction, the injury, the things you do in hate, in jealousy, and in all these things you do unto one another, so you do unto me. Because there is no separation. Know you not when you speak ill of one, you speak ill of me. When you degrade another, you have degraded the Christ of God. Always think first before you speak. Benediction. Full oh, infinite splendor in thy infinite creation, the rhythm of thy eternal voice is heard everywhere. The infinitude of form arises from within thy heart, which beats with everlasting joy. And it is this that throbs in my soul. I have heard thy voice through the Christ within, revealing all as one and one as all. Now I know the words of the Master are true. He that beholds me beholds him who sent me. O oh, glorious one. Let us enter into the sanctuary of the silence. 